Hello, can, I hope you can hear me a little better. Great. Um, we're just waiting for one of our panel members to join us from Kampala uh, via Zoom, but um, hope we're all connected. Um, I'm not sure if this is your first session or not, but at the IGF, uh, everyone's um, hopefully able to connect as well via uh, their login and through the Zoom uh, connection so that you can field uh, questions to the uh, panel. So if you'd like to log in and join the session as well, even though you're here in person, which is great, that will also help those that are joining us through the hybrid mode, so those that are joining us from outside of Ethiopia, they'll also have a better idea of who's here and who's asking questions, and it'll be a little easier for them to follow through the hybrid format. So we'll try to get started in just a couple of minutes on time. Yeah, this is the thing, yeah, yeah. Do you want to just take that, the, take that thing, please? Okay, we'll be starting in about one minute. And I will just turn off my sound so you don't get the echo. Hopefully that's better. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Do you want to just turn off the sound? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session, to this uh, this workshop on access to remedies and safeguarding rights to privacy and data protection. Uh, welcome everyone who's been able to join us here in Addis, and also we are very glad to have those joining us online through the hybrid mode uh, through Zoom. Um, my name is Jonathan Andrew. I'm working with the Danish Institute for Human Rights. I'm joined by my colleagues from the Danish Institute, uh, Catherine Block uh, Weberg, um, who works in the human rights and business team. Also, um, I'm joined by uh, Lena um, Gamrath Rasmussen, who works in our international team. Um, together, they'll be assisting in the in terms of the online format. So. They will be helping with the moderation and the fielding of questions, both from the audience here with us in the room, in, in the press briefing room in Addis, and also those of you that are joining us online. Um, just to run through the, the format, um, it's 60 minutes. The session will be keeping my introduction as brief as possible because the main point is to hear from our panelists and uh, gain uh, from their expertise um, in joining this session. Um, each of the participants, uh, the four panel members, will have 10 minutes to, to give their presentation and give their insights on this issue. Um, we'll have, at the end, 15 minutes or so for questions and answers, and we'll try to stick as best as possible to that format. As I say, you can uh, post your questions through, uh, through Zoom. Um, to our moderators who will then uh, bring the questions to the panel. Um, so just by way of an introduction, the Danish Institute, Institute for Human Rights is a national human rights institute and uh, we are working uh, closely with other national human rights institutions uh, with a number who have joined us uh, here in Addis um, for the IGF. Um, we are working um, on a number of issues, and one of which is access to remedies, which is part of um, a broader um, project and uh, initiative, the Action Coalition on Responsible Technology, which is 
uh, an initiative that is um, funded in part by the uh, Danish Foreign Ministry, which brings together different stakeholders from civil society, from uh, non-governmental organizations, businesses, and other interested stakeholders um, who are participating in a year-long uh, program of events to strengthen uh, the use of um, technologies responsibly on a global level. And as part of that, we have a work stream on policy coherence. And this session actually forms part of that uh, work stream, looking at how uh, regulations um, and additional, di different initiatives on the legislati legislative front are um, aligning or not aligning in terms of coherence and uh, how policy is developing on a global front. Um, so. Um, without more ado, I shall um, start the uh, s different uh, presentations by introducing you to our four panel members. Um, I'll start just for a brief introduction and then before each uh, of our presenters gives their presentation, I'll just give you a bit more about their background and their biography. We had uh, joining us Cynthia Chepkamoy, who is on my right from Kenya. Um, we have Stella Alibetiz, who is joining us from Uganda online. We have Mosa Thekiso from South Africa. And we have Maureen Mwadume from Kenya. So starting first, uh, we shall have Cynthia Chepkamoy um, speak. Cynthia is a legal practitioner, licensed to practice in Kenya, and currently working as a data protection counsel. Her speciality is in advising and guiding organizations to set up data governance frameworks in compliance with data protection laws. Cynthia has extensive experience in digital rights, internet governance, data protection and privacy compliance and cybersecurity audits. She has partnered and worked with Kiktonet, GIZ and Unwanted Witness in the Uganda as a consultant and trainer of trainers. Uh, additionally, she is also one of the founding members of the Association of, of Privacy Lawyers in Africa. So welcome and the floor is yours, thank you. Thank you, Jordan Sam, for the um, introduction. And uh, I'll go straight to uh, the business of the day in terms of uh, safeguarding, safeguarding the right to privacy and data, which is access to remedies. And uh, I'm going to actually make a presentation on how we approach um, violation of privacy uh, rights in Kenya and give a brief uh, legislative background on how we go about it. So uh, when you look at the legal framework in Kenya, we have the Data Protection Act of 2019 and we also have the Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act of 2018. Um, with the Act, which is the Data Protection Act, we have the regulations that actually give us the procedural laws on how we should uh, conduct registration of data controllers and processors. It also provides uh, the complaint handling procedures on how you should file a complaint with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. Well, uh, but then today we are going to look at mechanisms to seek redress where there is violation of privacy. And uh, it's been a painstaking uh, process to bring to book some of the uh, violators of privacy rights. And it, I'm sorry to say that some of these companies are big tech companies. And uh, sometimes we learn that we are not, the citizens are not aware of the procedures that they need to follow. That means we need to do a lot of uh, sensitization and capacity building to the citizen on how to actually uh, follow the legal procedures to seek redress. So uh, I'm going to actually make a brief presentation on the mechanisms to seek redress. And I'm going to talk about the complaints handling mechanisms and enforcement. And from time to time, uh, you'll realize that these violations have become rampant. And at some point, uh, an individual feels like they don't really have the authority or rather the power to bring the perpetrators of uh, privacy violations to book, then how do we go about it in such a circumstance? So one, uh, what I'd like to say is the act comprehensively governs the processing and storage of personal data 
by governments and private sectors, and that means the authority that has been established by the Act, which is the data, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, is the proper authority to handle such complaints. But then previously, before that, uh, such complaints used to be actually uh, filed at the Office of, uh, at the High Court, because back then we didn't have a legal basis for um, bringing up complaints in terms of uh, privacy. And it also et establishes an intricate system of rights and obligations that operationalize the right to privacy. Data protection authorities actually have a duty to receive and act on all complaints by individuals. And sometimes the authority on their own motion can investigate issues they have identified. I can give an example of a recent enforcement notice that was released by the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. Uh, requiring 40 digital lending companies to actually uh, comply and the Office of the Data Protection uh, was calling upon them to comply with the law and the very first stage of actually getting them to comply is uh, the office conducting privacy audits so that they look at their compliance level in terms of data governance. Have they actually registered as data controllers or processors? And where they have not registered, it means they have not, uh, they're not yet compliant at that point. So in as much as we register or a company, the data controllers and processors register as, data, as a data controller or a processor, then the question is, what policies do they have in place to ensure that there is a uh, protection of uh, information, personal information, personal data that they process belonging to the uh, data subjects. So the first uh, thing that the ODPC was doing at, with that enforcement notice was notifying, notifying the uh, processors that there's a new law and you need to register and you need to provide uh, the data subjects with a policy stipulating how you intend to safeguard their personal data. And Moving forward to the next slide, sorry. Then there are different reporting mechanisms when you talk of uh, violations to privacy. How do we report? And the first point of call for any institution is normally to resolve the dispute in-house. Do you have an alternative dispute resolution mechanism in your privacy, data protection and privacy policy that where there's a data breach, this is how we are going to approach this violation or this breach, then we'll have to actually resolve the dispute in-house before we escalate it to the uh, commissioner's office. And in this process, ADR is actually encouraged and that has also been provided under the uh, Data Protection Act of Kenya 2019. The same is also provided on our constitution, that is the Constitution of Kenya, where it provides for in Article 159 and uh, where it provides for um, the, the right to actually uh, resolve disputes out of court through alternative forms of dispute resolution such as negotiation, reconciliation and arbitration. So where a privacy policy provides for ADR, parties are bound by it and you might not actually escalate a matter to a higher body or a tribunal or let's say a court before actually having the matter be heard under alternative forms of dispute resolution. Then Okay. Well, uh, sorry if you are not really able to view my slides. I wish there was a way we could project on the screen. Okay, let me share my screen. Oh, that's what. Sorry. Apologies for that. Apologies, but I had not really gone that far with the presentation. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Um, then the second point of call, when, it's, uh, when we have a violation of privacy rights, is the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. And this is the authority 
in Kenya when we when, when it has to actually set the rules and regulations on how personal data is being handled, it's being processed, it's being stored. And actually this is where all the data controllers and processors uh, are required to report to any issue of uh, data breach or a data, uh, data loss. So uh, a person who suffers a damage by reason of contravention of a requirement of this act is entitled to compensation for the damage uh, from the data controller or the data processor but then how do you get to the point where you are entitled to the damages it means you have to file a complaint to the office of the data protection commissioner so how do we do this the procedure has been provided for in the regulations on uh, complaints uh, filing of complaints and the first uh, just to give a brief uh, brief to take you through a brief uh, walkthrough of what happens is first you go to the ODPC portal which is a website that's available online and can be accessed by anyone at any time. The first thing is you will fill a form that will actually ask you to state what rights were violated that is your rights as a data subject, your privacy rights in terms of personal uh, data. How were they violated? Who violated this? Then that means you'll have to provide the details of the data controller or the processor who violated these rights. And uh, you need also to attach uh, evidence to show that your rights were actually violated. It could be a report or uh, a screenshot of how the violation occurred. It could be that the data controller or processor actually used your personal data for marketing which is an offense under the Data Protection Act because where you use personal data for commercial purposes, that is profit making, then uh, it would be a violation of the rights of the data subjects. We would also talk about unconsensual sharing of information of the data, of the data subject. We would also say sharing information to third parties where while in the process of collecting data, the data subject knew that this information is going to be used by this company and you've not consented for this information to be used by a third party or to be shared with a third party. So where this information is actually shared with a third party without your consent, then that will amount to violation of your rights as a data subject. And remember, this is personal data, not any other type of data. So. Uh, in that regard, I'd say while you've actually filed the complaint with the office, the office takes around 14 days to respond to the complaint and the other party will also be called in to give their evidence and uh, I know you understand the issues of fair administrative action. Each party must be given uh, an opportunity to defend their side. And at this point, if the data controller or processor actually had uh, policies or do we call them agreements where the uh, data subject consented to the process. M many a times we realize that we consent to so many, uh, we consent to our data being used uh, severally with other third parties, with be being shared with third parties, but then do we really sit down to read the terms and condition of the agreements we normally sign? So most of the time we realize that too long didn't read. And then when your privacy rights are violated, you cry fall, but then it's mostly the fault of the data subject that they fail to read the terms and conditions of the contracts that they entered into. And uh, to curb this, many a times I advise our clients, let's say for instance, it's a hospital or a school and you're processing children's personal data or maybe this is a patient who's supposed to be transferred to another hospital for medication then it's important you have data sharing agreements in that regard and this will actually uh, protect the organization from liability and actually the court, court proceedings and of course the complaints being filed at the office of the data protection commissioner thirdly we have the court which is the last uh, call and this is where uh, actually before the office of the data protection was uh, inaugurated a while back then the court was the uh, only uh, channel where we could file complaints in terms of privacy and the basis was normal, was actually find, founded on uh, the constitution 
uh, Article 31 of the Constitution on the right to privacy. So uh, when we look at the role of the role of reg regulatory and oversight bodies in terms of enforcement, uh, the first thing that comes in mind as a regulatory body, let's say this is an authority like the Data Protection Commissioner, is to ensure that registration and issuance of, of certificates has been actually uh, done and the certificates be provided to the data controllers and processors. I don't know what, okay, sorry. And uh, in doing this, this is the first stage of compliance and actually ensuring that data controllers and processors are processing personal data uh, legally because at the end of the day, you need to have a legal basis for processing personal data. Secondly, uh, we'll have also uh, uphold the data subject access request because as a data controller or a processor, many a times we find that you process and store a lot of information. How do you ensure that the moment a uh, data subject walks in, they are able to assess their information? Do you have uh, a system or a procedure in which they can assess this information? Remember, this information should be assessed without them being paid. But from time to time, you and it's been practice in the space that sometimes you go to an institution request for your information, but then you are told for you to assess this information, you need to pay this amount. But is it right that you need to pay a certain fee to assess your personal data? That should not be the case. Uh, thirdly, I'd say one of the role of the regulators is to ensure that data controllers and processors have privacy policies and cookie compliance regulations. What do I mean by privacy policies and cookie compliance regulation? This is the procedure standards and guidelines that provide uh, uh, the, 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 the institution with how they actually handle personal data from processing in respect to their rights. What rights do the data subject have? Are these uh, policies conforming to the uh, data protection principles? So this is where all this is laid down and for how long are we going to process this data? For how long are we going to store it? And what are your retention periods? And not forgetting the most important aspect of a privacy policy, and I would love to emphasize this more, is on the technical safeguards. Because why would we have a policy or an agreement communicating to our clients and our data subjects, but then fail to ensure that we also have uh, technical safeguards. So what technical safeguards are in place to ensure that this data is secured? That talks of, and that speaks to data security. Um, and for companies that have websites, definitely they'll need to have cookies, cookie, cookie compliant policies and regulations and uh, provide what kind of uh, cookies do you use on your website? Is it analytical cookies or is it the other type of cookies? And do you give your audience the option to choose which cookies they would love to actually uh, track their activities? Well, um, another important tool is the data protection impact assessment, which actually enables data controllers and processors at the inception of every project to understand that um, we are processing sensitive data, but then the question is, this is data that might result to high risk to the rights of the data subject in case of a data breach. Then the first point of call is to conduct a data protection impact assessment, which will enable, give you an IBAD's view of how you are going to secure the rights of the data subject in the process of conducting this project or research. Well, and transfer impact assessment is another tool that's used by the oversight bodies to ensure that the rights of the data subjects are protected online, not online, sorry, uh, in the course of any processing or maybe where there's a transfer from one country to another or where there's a transfer from some of their partners in business. It could be a pharmaceutical company supplying medicine to a hospital and you need to share some information that could be sensitive. Well, okay. So um, I'd stop from there. Then uh, Stella will proceed from where I've left. But then, yeah.
Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, I'm just going to pass on to Stella Alibetis. Um, she's joining us from Kampala. And just in the interest of time, um, I think we'll be um, reviewing the points that are raised just at the end of the session when we get to the questions and answers. So thank you, Cynthia. Um, some wonderful insights from the work you've been doing in Kenya. Um, obviously, a great amount of progress has been made and it shows that engagement with uh, citizens informing them of their rights, but also importantly, uh, the importance of understanding what channels, what avenues are available to them needs to be uh, a main point of, of work of those that are working in the advocacy area. Um, so I'm going to ask for Stella Alibatiz to join us um, through Zoom. So Stella is an advocate and works as the director of the Personal Data Protection Office of Uganda. The Personal Data Protection Office is an independent office set up under the National Information Techno Technology Authority of Uganda and is responsible for personal data protection in the country. Prior to this appointment, Stella worked as the Director for Regulation and Legal Services at the National Information Technology Authority and has held other positions in the private and public sector. She is responsible for the management and opera operations of the Personal Data Protection Office, which is the national focal point for monitoring and assurance of matters relating to the implementation of Uganda's Data Protection and Privacy Act. She is a practicing advocate with 26 years of experience on policy and regulatory matters in the public sector. So I'm hoping, yes, I can see Stella is there with us, so I'll let you Stella, take the floor and welcome, and thank you for joining us. Hopefully you can hear us. Have you unchecked your mute? I, we can't hear you yet. Uh, just want to check you've unchecked your mute. Yes, we can hear you now. Great. decision making and 
many others that are provided for. Uh, the law also provides for the personal data protection office, which I get. Um, we know that uh, from the Malabo Convention and other regional frameworks, um, the, there's a requirement that regulators for uh, data protection and privacy are independent uh, bodies. Um, so government set up this office. It is within an existing office, but provided for its uh, independence. I think at another opportune time, I'll be able to explain uh, why we have that set up and how it works um, in Uganda. Now, this office is given the mandate to implement the Data Protection and Privacy Act. Uh, part of our mandate includes um, resolving complaints from data subjects. So, if you find that your rights have been infringed upon by a data controller or a data processor, uh, the law gives you right uh, to make a complaint uh, to the uh, Data Protection Office. We also provide uh, guidance especially to data controllers in regards to the interpretation of the law, uh, in regards to issues related to um, compliance. The law also gives us powers to make directions uh, to inform some of the actions that are done by the data controllers. It gives us power to investigate and we can also uh, prosecute um, where we find there has been non-compliance. Under the same law, we are required to register all data controllers and uh, data processors. And currently, that system is uh, online. So the entire system, up to when you get your certificate, how you pay for your certificate is entirely uh, online. Um, currently, under that same system, we have automated
we normally train them on how to deal with, um, with uh, various uh, conflicts. Um, uh, I'll briefly, uh, Jonathan says I have comments. Um, once that complaint comes to us, we have the mandate and the law to investigate that complaint. Uh, we have a mandate to invite um, uh, witnesses who we can interview and then make a determination. Um, our determination must be writing and we are required to uh, communicate our decision. If a party is unhappy with any decision that we make, the law provides for right of appeal to the minister of ICT and national guidance. And then of course, if they are unhappy with the decision that has been made uh, by the minister, then they need to have a recourse uh, to go to court. Um, despite the fact that this law has been in place uh, for a limited time, we already have uh, cases in our courts where um, uh, plaintiffs have exercised their right to privacy and succeeded in our, in our courts. Although uh, most of those decisions were based on Article 27 of our Constitution, which guarantees our right uh, to privacy. In terms of our current dispensation, uh, given that our regulations were passed in 2021, uh, we do not yet have uh, any prosecution that we've had. 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 Thank you very much, Stella. Wonderful presentation. Um, clearly, you've been exceptionally busy to see that you've achieved so much when you've had uh, legislation that's just been in place, a key legislation since 2021. It's uh, very impressive just how much you've achieved. And I think um, one of the key points clearly being that you've done a lot of work to um, make um, provide information and to provide um, means mechanisms that are accessible to citizens um, so that they can use these mechanisms to bring up their grievances, which is obviously incredibly important. And you've been doing a lot of work. I've been looking at your website, seeing the information that you're providing, which also I think is a key takeaway in terms of ensuring that um, information is available and accessible. Um, and clearly raising um, with the number of complaints, you mentioned the 2000 complaints, that points obviously to some concerns that data protection um, provisions may be breached, but also that um, you have a system that's allowing a large number of citizens to um, raise their grievances and be heard. So thank you very much. And moving on, we shall be uh, now um, having the presentation from Moza Stekiso. So Moza joins us from Johannesburg. She's working with the Vodacom Group in South Africa. Um, she joined the group in June 2020 as Executive Head of International Legal and Regulatory with a focus on artificial intelligence, digital services and platforms. She works closely with the Vodacom International Business and Big Data teams, focusing on regulatory and policy matters, including with regard to the deployment of data-driven products and services across Vodacom Group's markets. Uh, Moza has a legal professional services background, having worked as an attorney for international law firms in South Africa and Tanzania. She has also experienced in data protection, including the GDPR, through her previous role as a leading data protection specialist advisory firm in Germany. And prior to joining Vodacom Group, Moza held a senior management position in commercial legal team of an African multinational telecommunications company specializing in digital services and mobile financial services. So thank you once again, Mosa, for joining us online. I'll let you now take the floor. Thank you. Yes, we can. Wow. 
want to, you know, to take Africa, um, you know, to, to take us fully into digital inclusion, financial inclusion. So those are the, the main topics that are top of mind for us. We don't want to get to a point where, you know, Africa or African countries in the DMV is behind from the digital economy perspective. So bearing that in mind, what's important for us is balancing us providing those data-driven services which are embedded in us being able to um, roll out the relevant technology. And a lot of emerging and new and technology requires a lot of data, data processing, so there's data-rich technology. So how do we balance actually using those technologies versus um, looking after the rights of our consumers? And um, we actually took, um, undertook a study where we looked at how we actually achieve that in the current community environment we have across Africa. And I think Stella has like, spoken to a lot of the remedies available. And these, uh, what should be pointed out is that these remedies do differ from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, which poses a lot of challenges for us as a business. And we, a big business, you know, we have the relevant um, measures in place. And you can only imagine how difficult it is for a small entity trying to, to maneuver through Africa business perspectives to grapple with those different roles as they change from country to country. And the main barriers we've, we've identified um, from, with regard to rolling out these data-rich technologies are data localization laws. Um, and what we've seen is, for example, when we're dealing with big data or AI technology and we leverage all those um, technology provided by cloud service providers, is that they tend to take a regional approach. So for us to use those Mauritius does have a, a robust data protection act, and act, and act um, which, takes which takes care of the rights of the data subject and also, and also the convention. Um, in addition to that, we also looked at, okay, if we, we looked at from a collateral perspective, we can look at preferential trade agreements. So we looked at Singapore, uh, which also is a good example and has robust uh, bilateral agreements with Australia. Thank you. 
recommendations on that, we understand that we need to protect the which is basically all the time these days. So we have our privacy impact assessments, which we already do internally, even for those jurisdictions that don't have laws in place. So for us, that's, that's internal best practice. So whenever we're dealing with any kind of data processing, we start off with our privacy impact assessment and that kind of leads us. Um, and like I've already like said, we have to adapt to adapt each jurisdiction accordingly, accordingly, take that into take account, that into account. Um, um, and also where we are given the opportunity to comment on the on various policies or, or laws that are still in draft, and we do that, we've just done that with, with the new bill in Tanzania. So we take a very robust approach, we try to be very balanced, um, you know, obviously what's very, what's key for us is protecting the rights of our consumers from a privacy perspective, and also without going too much into the AI side, you know, it is a little bit more broader than that from an AI perspective, you know, then we come into other constitutional rights. Without data protection laws, so I think there's really some great insights for other businesses operating in this area to see um, the great um, preemptive, proactive approach that you've been adopting. So thank you very much. Um, moving swiftly on, just to keep with the schedule, um, our next speaker will be Maureen Mwadime from the Kenyan National um, Human Rights Commission. Thank you very much for joining us, Maureen. Maureen is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a senior human rights officer at the Kenyan National Commission. Um, her practice focuses on human rights, including digital and economic, social and cultural rights. She is engaged in constitutional litigation, legislation review, international reforms, com community engagement and partnership building at the National Commission in Kenya. In November uh, 2022, so this month, uh, Maureen was recognized as the Public Sector Lawyer of the Year, so congratulations, Maureen, for that award. <laughs> and prior to joining the division, Maureen worked in private law firms and commercial litigation and transactions, as well as Kenya's Refugees, as well as at Kef Kenya's Refugees Affairs Secretariat. So thank you, Maureen, and take the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Andrew. And... Um, 
the Danish Institute for Human Rights in general for this uh, uh, session. I'm honored indeed to speak before this uh, brilliant delegation, both online and um, you know here in the room. Um, the three presenters have touched on policy and legislative landscape, so I'll mainly focus on um, the role of NHRIs um, and access to remedies with a specific focus on uh, digital rights. So basically, uh, national human rights institution and access to rem remedies uh, with uh, reference to digital rights. Um, in this particular case, I will restrict myself to the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, uh, who is my employer. I know there are several human rights institutions here, so I will not pretend to speak for them. Um, so uh, very briefly about Kenya National Commission on Human Rights. Um, we are an status a national human rights institution um, as per the Paris principles. And um, we are established under Article 59 of our constitution uh, as well as operationalized by an act of parliament. Um, the commission's broad mandates uh, cut across promoting protection and upholding of human rights in Kenya. Uh, the, uh, the Commission's functions are laid out uh, in the Constitutive Act, which I have said is the KNCHR Act, and uh, these functions include research and monitoring, uh, basically monitoring compliance of human rights standards uh, in public and private institutions, uh, conducting human rights education and training, uh, carrying out um, campaigns, advocacy, and collaboration with stakeholders in order to safeguard human rights, as well as investigate and secure appropriate redress for victims of human rights violations. So we can see that uh, we clearly, um, you know, can speak on matters digital rights in as far as our mandate is concerned. Uh, with reference to our discussion topic today, uh, I think by now it has become very clear that even seemingly neutral technologies can actually replicate um, pre-existing uh, inequalities and marginalization. Uh, technology impacts human rights positively and at the same time uh, negatively. And this is where the role of oversight institutions come in. Um, uh, I have uh, had my colleague uh, from uh, the Office of the Data Protection Commission, I think from Uganda, speak. And um, from my case, uh, as an oversight institution, I will uh, give the point of view as uh, an NHRI, as a national human rights institution. So um, as, an, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a national human rights uh, institution, KNCHR is very keen on oversighting online spaces to ensure that the milestones made in the physical world are not lost um, in digital spaces. There are so many issues, human rights concerns that have been happening uh, in the online spaces. Unfortunately, most of us do not tag them as such. Uh, human rights issues. And for one, uh, what has been happening, um, uh, case study, Kenya, uh, we have had a lot of complaints on matters of uh, freedom of expression, uh, where activists uh, get arrested and charged, especially with offenses under the cyber crimes. Uh, cyber crimes and uh, computer misuse act and this was uh, majorly during the COVID-19 period where um, human rights defenders really took to it to express themselves online as opposed to going on the streets due to the uh, limitations that we are all familiar with. Then the other one is on censoring and blocking. Uh, you have an institution, a public institution, have a Twitter handle or a Facebook um, uh, page Unfortunately, uh, when uh, they zero down on you and say that, uh, well, this person is making negative uh, comments because of A, B, C, and D, and they do not like uh, your actions, then what do they do? Uh, they block you from um, re receiving any, any messages or interacting further um, on that particular uh, platform. The other is on surveillance, capitalism, and government, uh, gov government um, surveillance. One targeting uh, consumer decisions uh, like the fintechs. Uh, this is a huge problem uh, in Kenya. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to the Central Bank of Kenya um, 
uh, that is really trying to regulate uh, this sector to ensure that there is some sort of sanity uh, with the fintechs and the other targeting civil political rights, that is the government surveillance, targeting civil political rights including um, voting rights. Um, we've also had quite a number of massive data uh, protection breaches. Uh, actually, um, prior to the elections this year, Kenya had its elections in um, August this year, a big number of Kenyans found themselves registered as members of political parties uh, with the office of the registrar of uh, political parties and they hadn't done that. So it was very interesting to find that um, um, uh, you know, political parties would go the extra mile uh, to get information, very, very, very specific information on individuals to be able to meet the threshold um, that was required by the Office of the Data Protection, uh, Office of the uh, Registrar of Political Parties uh, to be able to register as a political party. Um, then um, the, the other thing is that uh, we are seeing quite a lot of movement in terms of compliance in the private space. In fact, um, recently the Office of the Data Protection Commission made a very positive comment on the uptake of, um, um, of uh, the regulations uh, and compliance procedures by the private companies. Uh, however, the government on the other end, um, that's uh, another story. Um, so basically, um, I think uh, we need to move uh, from from that um, you know from that space where we are thinking that as government, then uh, what we do definitely can be sanitized. It is okay, but to be very sincere. Uh, governments really are the largest data controllers. They hold the largest amount of data. So in as much as we are talking about the companies getting um, uh, regulated, we also as governments uh, need to ensure that uh, we comply uh, with the laws that um, uh, we put in place. Uh, so issues to do with uh, the regulation compliance and, and um, uh, the specific uh, um, parameters for compliance that have been put, put in place by the Office of the Data Protection Commission. Uh, so basically this misguided, um, you know, uh, belief that the public sector uh, um, that cannot infringe on data uh, needs, <laughs> needs to end. Because that is where actually most of the data is drawn from, you know. Uh, looking back, we have had so many instances where um, uh, private companies have tried to get information from Kenyans. Uh, I remember there was a case way, way back uh, before we got our Data Protection Act, where one of the telecommunications company tried to uh, put uh, surveillance on the SIM cards. Unfortunately, or fortunately, um, the commission, as well as several human rights defenders, moved to court very, very, very swiftly, and uh, the court managed to declare such a such an act uh, very unconstitutional. Um, uh, so what am I saying? Basically, state departments, uh, agencies, the government in general should lead by example and implement data privacy uh, programs within within their organizations. And uh, lastly, um, on uh, the issue about the access to remedy itself, uh, it is my humble opinion that uh, national human rights institutions are very independent and trusted entities. Uh, so um, we definitely get quite a lot of uh, complaints and a lot of, uh, of feedback uh, from the communities or the users of these particular technologies. So when it comes to providing legal advice, uh, holding public awareness forums, that we definitely do to ensure that the citizens are actually helped to understand their rights, especially with regards to digital rights. Um, however, uh, all stakeholders in the digital sector need to work very, very close together. 
uh, because we all know th we all know and appreciate that um, human rights are interdependent the different roles that we play here in our respective capacities all complement each other so working in silos won't work it is about time that we as stakeholders in different capacities in different um, as different actors in the sector come uh, together uh, to be able to um, you know impact uh, positively on matters ensuring protection uh, of uh, the users of the technology that we develop. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Andrew. Thank you very much, Maureen. I think um, really the key point, as you say, is one of cooperation, collaboration, that together we can um, work on some of these issues. We can prevent uh, the breaches um, of the right to privacy, right to data protection. We can do work in terms of prevention, but also um, do a lot of work collectively to facilitate um, the access to remedies for uh, through different mechanisms for citizens, for residents in the respective countries by um, sharing and pooling our resources. We have a few more minutes left, so I'd just like to see uh, if we have any questions from the audience to our panel. Yes, can I take that question at the back? And we have a gentleman here. We'll see if we can, with just a few minutes, if you could keep it brief um, in terms of your question, thank you. Sure, I'll make it a tweet. Um, my name is Chennai, I'm from Mozilla Foundation and thank you for the panel. My question to all the panelists and anyone can pick it is, how do you navigate digital illiteracy and accessibility issues in order for you to then be working towards safeguarding um, the digital rights that you're working towards? Okay, um, perhaps I can put that to Maureen first. Okay, sure. Uh, interesting that uh, Amazon, it's Amazon, right? No. Sorry? A Mozilla? Okay, interesting. Interesting that uh, a private actor has asked that because we had the conversation with, with Ericsson <laughs> yesterday and um, what we were trying to ask ourselves is how best can we work to ensure that the vulnerable and marginalized groups uh, are not um, impacted by our actions when it comes to, you know, the access and, and whatnot, yeah? Unfortunately, uh, what is happening right now is that um, technology is coming to marginalize the vulnerable even further. So we were trying to think, uh, is it a possibility for us as an NHRI to work with, um, uh, for instance, the, um, uh, the networking companies uh, to be able to understand um, the need uh, of specific areas that we have uh, mapped out? And uh, secondly, to ensure that uh, if networking is done, then the same is equitably distributed. Again, there's a business angle to, it's a long conversation. There's a business angle to that on um, whether they'll be able to recoup their profits when they go in there. Uh, for instance, the arid and semi-arid lands. Um, how best can we have government incentives to ensure that uh, such companies can be able to come in and still reach these far-flung areas and uh, at the same time mitigate on their costs? So it's, it, it's an issue that requires a multi-sectoral um, approach. It is not one that can be dealt by one actor. Something that requires the mapping aspect, the monitoring aspect, the reporting aspect, uh, so that the vulnerable and marginalized groups actually benefit from the networking. Thank you. Thank you. And whilst we've just still got a bit of time, I'd also like to put that to Stella at the Ugandan Data Protection Office. Stella, can you take the floor? Thank you. I think you might be on mute. Can you hear us, Stella? I think you're on mute. I'll just see if I can unmute you. Uh, are you? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we can't hear you at this point. Yes, we can hear you now. Those are the only 
also enabled SMS and, uh, and other technology that enables um, an individual, as long as they have some technology, to be able to do that. So that is how we are addressing some of those issues. Obviously, it is a journey, and um, I think for government, what we need to do is to continue with those efforts until we bridge uh, those gaps. Thank you. Done a lot of work uh, working with people in different communities around, for example, uh, public services like hospitals, education, etc. Well, um, so to respond to that question, and it's uh, it's a problem. It cuts across uh, digital literacy. How do we go about it? Uh, having worked with uh, different institutions in creating awareness and improving digital literacy among. Uh, the marginalized communities, and more especially women and children, uh, the best approach is to work through associations. That's where you can reach many people and many institutions. Like from time to time, we train children on uh, digital literacy. We train uh, them on cyber security and the skills they need to stay safe online. So it goes to identifying specific groups that actually are more marginalized in the digital space. And at times, one of the major challenges has been uh, the infrastructure itself. In as much as you are trying to roll out the services to marginalized communities, you'll realize that they lack the infrastructure. So it even becomes more difficult to enhance digital literacy. But then through working with associations and civil society organization, then uh, add, as Maureen had said earlier, that it calls for a multi-stakeholder kind of approach, a collaborative approach, so that you can actually attain and reach the digital literacy levels that we need to see among our people here. Yeah. Thank you very much, Cynthia. We're running out of time. I just like, unfortunately, I don't think we'll have time to take any further questions because we've already overrun a little bit. But I would like to just point, uh, put that to Mosa, joining us from Johannesburg on the part of Vodacom. Um, perhaps you have some um, comments to make around communications and the way the Vodacom has been reaching out and making sure everyone from different communities are included and informed. Thank you, Mosa. to approach us so we can educate them on that. So yeah, yeah very robust. Thank you very much, Mosa. Well, we've managed to cover, I think, a great deal of ground in this just short session of one hour. Um, I want to obviously take the opportunity to thank all of you in the audience for joining us, both here in Addis and also online. Um, I'm extremely grateful, and the Danish Institute's very grateful for um, our, our panel members, to Cynthia, um, to Maureen, to Mosa, and Stella, thank you for joining us. Um, I think this um, session has really highlighted the value of collaboration, cooperation between those such as Cynthia 
um, data protection and privacy lawyers working on strategic lit litigation, but also working with associations on the ground in communities, working with public authorities to help uh, raise awareness of challenges and also educate on issues around privacy and data protection. To Maureen, working in the Ken Kenyan National Human Rights Commission for her, her work, reaching out, working with different stakeholders, also holding the government to account and speaking to public authorities, which is clearly, uh, clearly critical work. Um, to Stella for her work uh, as director leading the Ugandan Data Protection Authority. Very impressive to see just how much ground they've covered and how much work they've been doing and um, how many citizens they've managed to engage who've been able to bring their concerns and seek access to remedies through the mechanisms that they facilitate. And also to Mosa Dekiso from uh, Vodacom, who just joined us today from Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, wonderful insights to see really um, how um, an organization, a business such as Vodacom working in different jurisdictions with many challenges with different uh, data laws, different privacy uh, concerns and regulations relating to constitutional provisions is able to take a proactive and preemptive approach to share pr best practice cro across its different divisions and really to engage and engage with the communities in making, sh making sure that communications are inclusive and that people are aware of their uh, privacy and data protection rights. So thank you once again. Thank you for joining us. Just one last point. Um, Danish Institute is always very willing to, to reach out, engage with different actors, different stakeholders in the space. We have different fora that we facilitate across the different divisions. We have a specific international mandate to engage. Um, so we would welcome um, if you want to speak to us afterwards, after this session, or reach out to us online through, um, through the Institute. Our uh, details are on our website. Um, then please do so, and we look forward to continue, continuing to work with you and um, moving forward in protecting and promoting human rights. And enjoy the conference, and thank you.